Order! Order! You are an incorrigible delinquent at times. <laughs> Behave yourself, man! Um, speaking of happy days, we turn our attention this morning to rather grim developments on the political landscape. Um, some slightly cynical attempts to ignore Michael Heseltine while picking over the bones of what David Lammy said yesterday about the extremely unpleasant tendencies of certain very, very prominent conservatives. Um, and that's what I want to examine with your help today. The, the, I want to undo the attempt to conflate people I know who voted to leave the European Union with people like Jacob Rees-Mogg who accidentally had dinner with a group of people who call for the repatriation of people like uh, Doreen Lawrence or indeed uh, Boris Johnson consorting with Steve Bannon, a man who suggests that you should wear the accusation of racism as a badge of honour. Actually, didn't j Dog hang out with Bannon as well, I think? But, so that, that's what I want to do. I'm not quite sure how we're going to do it. And as I said a moment ago, um, I only realised what I was thinking. My thoughts only have finally arrived at a destination shortly before coming on air. So it may all fall apart like the proverbial cheap suit before we even get to the quarter past break. Later in the programme, we'll be looking at Extinction Rebellion and their determination today to disrupt the capital city and beyond in the hope of finally... Uh, creating a political will, a political appetite for the sort of policies that are needed in their view to save the very planet which we inhabit. And then I like the story about no-fault evictions being abolished. I like it for a number of reasons, not least because it will improve the lot of tenants. But, I, you know, um, I've said this a few times. I belong to a generation where... We wouldn't have, for, for, from a certain background, far from a rarefied background, I think this would have held true for many, many people of my age, we wouldn't have contemplated starting a family until we had some sort of security in the context of property and our home. Even if you're renting with promises about no-fault evictions being abolished, I do worry that this story provides yet more evidence of us slipping slowly back into a, a, a society where ownership was the privilege of a shrinking few and the rest of us well, I use us very loosely but um, the rest of us would essentially be paying for the privilege of living in and buying somebody else's property uh, six minutes after ten I like the Shamima Begum story as well for a number of reasons not least because I was toying with the idea of filing the whole of today's program under the umbrella better safe than sorry I, I don't want David Lammy to be right when he warns about echoes of 1930s politics appearing on the British political landscape, the modern British political landscape, and beyond, of course. Um, uh, uh, and I don't want Michael Heseltine, Lord Heseltine, a, a, a grandee of Mrs Thatcher's cabinets. I don't want him to be right either. I don't want his warnings to be something that I feel we should heed. But I, I can't help wondering what's happened to us if former members of Labour and Conservative governments are both warning about the sort of extremism that appears to be on the rise. And people in my profession, looking at the Daily Telegraph particularly this morning, are putting enormous effort into trying to poo-poo these warnings, often without reference to Michael Heseltine. If it's a right-wing journalist trying to bring down the wrath of the uninformed upon David Lammy, then it would obviously be rather problematic to say, well, Michael Heseltine has essentially endorsed Lammy's comments. So then you start getting a bit sort of conspiratorial about it, you know. Who here hasn't accidentally promoted a party on, on Twitter, a German political party on Twitter that um, has called for refugees to be shot? And we've all We've all accidentally had dinner with people who want Doreen Lawrence to be deported, you know. I think it's a, it's a, it's a sign of Jacob Rees-Mogg's great sociability that he finds himself knocking about with these people. And, and, you know, who hasn't accidentally had tea with Steve Bannon, a man who thinks that accusations of racism should be worn like a badge of honour, and who has boasted about his intention to undermine or, or, or seek to undermine the European elections? Um, just, just at what point, at what point does hanging out with white supremacists and white nationalists become sympathy for white supremacists and white nationalists? At what point does retweeting white supremacists and white nationalists become sympathy for white supremacists and white nationalists? At what point does having dinner with white supremacists and white nationalists become sympathy for white supremacists and white nationalists? At what point does a Facebook account dedicated to you, Jacob Rees-Mogg, um, become problematic if it is full. There's a fantastic investigation by Tortoise, a, a new media company, into those um, 
into that particular fan page and the utterly, utterly vile content that's contained wherein. At what point would you, if you were a prominent political figure in Britain, at what point would you start to wonder why you are attracting so many people who appear to subscribe to, and I have to say this, Nazi-esque ideology. Absolutely no suggestion whatsoever that either of these words should be applied to either of the people whose fans almost boast about their sympathy for, for deporting people like Doreen Lawrence, getting rid of all the Muslims. The AFD, of course, um, campaigned under a Muslim-free Bavaria at one point in local elections in Germany. I think it's perfectly easy to fall in with people like that by accident, especially if you're incredibly highly educated and you've attended the finest school and universities in the world. I, yeah, absolutely, you could accidentally find yourself having dinner with people who want to deport Doreen Lawrence, and through no fault of your own, you could end up with online fan clubs that make Mein Kampf look like Peter and Jane. Absolutely. Nothing to see here. Except for this attempt to conflate the men who write about Muslim women looking like bank robbers, who write about uh, piccaninnies with watermelon smiles, who lie about 80 million Turks being poised to invade Europe, except the men like Boris Johnson. And, and don't forget that his column, as his own employers contested last week, shouldn't be taken seriously. It's not, it's not obviously evidence-based or factual. It's just a bit of sort of comic polemic, they claimed, while failing to fend off. Um, action from the regulator pointing out that he talked undiluted twaddle in his column in January, claiming national support for leaving with no deal. So, how do we separate the two? Because I don't believe for a minute that what they are claiming is true. That when you point out that Jacob Rees-Mogg has dined with people that want to deport Doreen Lawrence, you are somehow suggesting that all 17.4 million people who voted to leave the European Union are comfortable with that sort of conduct. Everyone I know who voted to leave the European Union would be as disgusted by that sort of conduct, um, by uh, amplifying the messages of, of the AFD, by comparing Muslim women to bank robbers. Everyone I know, and I know a lot of people who voted to leave the European Union, on the left and the right, oddly, none of them would like this stuff. So why, why is it so successful this attempt to conflate the two that's what i want to look at and 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 this might you might think i'm being facetious here but you, you know me well enough by now to know that i'm not i i would like you to talk to me if you voted to leave the european union but you agree with michael heseltine and david lammy when they warn that there are echoes in modern British politics of what went on in Germany in the 1930s. And there's a reason why everyone's picking on Lamy today. Partly because, obviously, the Andrew Marr programme draws, rightly or wrongly, rather more attention than Channel 4 News. But if you are essentially going to set yourself up as an apologist for these men, these two men who routinely find themselves accidentally caught up in pretty toxic contexts, if you're going to set yourself up as an apologist for them, you kind of have to ignore Michael Heseltine agreeing with David Lammy. I mean, David Lammy is, is, is left-wing and black, you know? That's pretty solid grounds for, for, a, for an unthinking attack from certain corners of our media and our political establishment. Michael Heseltine is rich, white and right-wing. So when he says he's hearing echoes of 1930s Germany and British politics, you've got two choices. You either pay attention or you pretend you haven't heard. And if you're dedicated to the notion of trying to dismantle David Lammy for saying things that are deeply troubling, you kind of have to ignore Michael Heseltine saying very, very similar stuff last night. You can't escape this chilling thought. The extremes of the 30s was born of economic stress. And the thing that is driving the extremes of today is the fact that we've had since 2008 frozen living standards. And people are looking for alibis. And if you put together the bureaucrats of, Russia, of Brussels, the immigrants and the foreigners and the elite, all that sort of stuff, it's got a, a sort of basic chilling appeal for people who are desperately looking for an alternative. People who are desperately looking for an alternative. Doesn't AFD stand for Alternative for Germany, I think, if you were to translate it? 
And Michael Heseltine responding to Krishna Guru Murthy's questions there, um, specifically about David Lammy's comments. So it's a partial endorsement of what Lammy said. It's not a full-throated endorsement, although they both shared a stage, as indeed did I, at the People's Vote rally a couple of weeks ago. That's what I want your help doing, OK? I, I, I don't want to have an argument today about Brexit, but I just want to know... I want you to reassure me that this, that you voted to leave the European Union, but you find some of the conduct and associations of men like Jacob Rees-Mogg and Boris Johnson just as despicable as the rest of us do, because that's what they're doing now. I noticed it on social media a couple of weeks ago, and I told you. The first person to try to do it was Dominic Raab, and, and it's really odd, but it's probably effective, and it's almost certainly been focus-grouped, and there's probably algorithms already kicking in to amplify and spread this utterly bogus message. But when I criticise Jacob Rees-Mogg and Boris Johnson, or by association, uh, Dominic Raab, when I point out that none of the promises that were made in the run-up to the Brexit referendum have been proved to be um, sound, then I'm somehow deliberately insulting everyone, my, my, my oldest friend, uh, family members, colleagues. I'm deliberately insulting all of you when I use evidence to criticise and condemn men like Johnson and Rhys Mogg. That took me weeks to work out. Couldn't quite get my head around why it all felt so wrong. But then, of course, as soon as you've worked it out, everything else slots into place. So don't let them do that. If, if you are comfortable offering your support to men who think, or, or men who accidentally end up having dinner with a group that thinks Baroness Lawrence should be deported, men who deliberately tweet the pronouncements of a political party in Germany that calls that well, essentially rose from the ashes of the Nazi party and thinks that refugees should be shot, a, a group that the Conservatives themselves disassociated themselves from in the European Parliament a few years ago. That's absolute, well, it's not fine, it's terrifying and wrong. But I acknowledge your existence. The idea that 17.4 million people are comfortable with Boris Johnson's Islamophobic rants about bank robbers and letterboxes, or, or with Jacob Rees-Mogg's amplifications of uh, German neo-Nazis, then that, that, I think, is a huge problem, and that's what Lammy's talking about. He's not talking about people who voted to leave the European Union for a whole host of perfectly plausible and reasonable grounds. This attempt to conflate the two is how fascism works. Um, if you're sceptical or, or cynical about their interventions, take a moment today to, to call me and tell me why you think David Lammy and Michael Heseltine should be ignored when they warn about the, the historical lessons of extremism. And in Lammy's case, going a little further, comparing some of the prominent so-called Brexiters to um, far-right figures from, from the European past. But more pertinently, and I, and I appreciate this could sort of just strike you as utterly insincere. I'm conscious of that, but you've got to do what you think is right. I think there must be millions of people who voted to leave the European Union that are just as disgusted by some of the antics of the of the, the extremist Brexiters as the rest of us are. I presume there is, otherwise Bami's warning becomes even more acute and even more urgent. 21 minutes after 10 is the time. 0345 60609 Seven three is the number that you need. And, and if I promise we won't have a row about Brexit, even if you're still persuaded that it, it, it can in any way improve your life or anybody else's life, we'll, we'll park that for today. You still want to leave the European Union, but you do not want to be lumped in with Jacob Rees-Mogg and Boris Johnson as they consort with white supremacists and amplify neo-Nazi political movements. Uh, John's in Worcester. John, what would you like to say? Well, I have to, I have to tell you uh, good morning. Hello, I have John. to tell you first thing. I'm a, I'm, I'm a Romania, but, a Romania, but uh, uh, I do I have lots of friends. Who... I want leavers. I want leavers. I know. They Carry did on. tell me that. But, but you're welcome. Uh, I do have several friends who are uh, very staunch leavers okay. who have recently changed their minds due specifically to the, the right wing associations. Well, they, they uh, are being, and I, I mean, I just don't want to sound ungrateful, but they, they, they are being um, utterly sidelined and ignored by all the media, myself included. This is, I pick all these fights every day with people who are furiously convinced it's still a great idea and who think Jacob Rees Mogg is 
the Messiah and Boris Johnson is, is, is the second coming and, and the people who voted to leave the European Union but find this lurch to the far right repellent that don't exist in the current conversations. I think un underlying racism in, in the UK is, is not is not something that's just been sort of that's just appeared on the on the horizon. It's been going on for many many, many, many years for many different subjects, but it's a very powerful tool. And when Lamy is going on about this, uh, relating it to Hitler, of course, you know, no one's going to carry out the atrocities that Hitler carried out. It's nothing to do with that. But I, I believe the ide ideology is exactly the same, to create division, to, to define an enemy. Uh, of course, the Jews, that was Hitler. We're now looking at uh, the EU is the, is the demon. Yes. Just like Orban in Hungary uses Soros. You have to define an, an enemy, normally imaginary enemy. You have to steer the people's hate towards that enemy uh, and you fragment society by doing that by fragmenting society it, you know basically what's happened in the uk is we, we turned against each other there was an absolute fragmented society in the uk and it's not just a fragmented uh, it's not fragmented on the level of oh i, I just disagree with you it's genuine hate it, there's hatred out there and that's the bit we don't really get because i, I unless i mean you're right perhaps to talk about the invented enemy. The EU does exist, George Soros does exist, but the, 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 the crimes that are laid at their feet are absurdly invented 99% of the time, but it's that 1% that provides the seed, isn't it, from which the trees of, of hatred can grow. Well, but how, how do you clever, tell the uh, difference, John? Game. How do you tell the difference? It's a clever I, I, game. Mog, Mog is a very nice, soft, mellow, nice face, the very, the sort of, just, you know, the nice guy from the 1800s world. But behind him is, it, it's not that at all. That is a, that's a Hollywood set. Um, there are some real, if you look at Fran Coes, if you look at Bridget, and if you look at what some of these people are saying, and if you look, if you go to Twitter and see what they, they, they post, yes. they, they're, they're posting the same post every day. It's, it's not, it's not, it's not individuals coming up with a, oh, I'm going to post this about this particular subject now, throw it out there. This is, this is organised. It's, it's organised. And, and it, yeah, well, and one wonders, again, whether or not there is some sort of coordination or, or, or some sort of plan in place. But, um, uh, again, for today's purposes, it's drawing the distinction between those of us who find far-right rhetoric repellent, regardless of how we voted in June 2016, and those of us who don't. Because it, yeah, I think I've got this right. It was 25 past 10. No one's pulled my pants down yet. This attempt to conflate criticism of extremist Brexiters with everyone who voted to leave, including people I've spoken to who realised the next morning that they'd made a mistake. Apparently I'm insulting them and calling them stupid, we're sneering, we're con it's so powerful. Because it's, it's a double bubble. On the one hand, here is an enemy that wishes you harm. So you're already cross and angry about that. Oh, and by the way, here's someone who is saying that you not liking that enemy that wishes you harm makes you stupid and racist and wrong. It's so clever. And yet so utterly thick at the same time. Ted is in Reading. Ted, what would you like to say? Good morning, James. Hello. Um, the, the, I, I voted leave. Um, yes. Do I regret it? Yes. Um, am I doing everything in my power to, to, to try to stop it? Yeah, probably not everything, but pretty close to. Sure. And I think the the swing to to the right. I think the right has always been there, um, but it's always been a minority. Um, I don't believe Britain's ever voted in a, a far right government, um, and there's a reason for that. Is generally we're, we're sensible. Um, we lose our senses every now and again, and this seems to be one of them. But the, this rhetoric from the right, the extreme right, needs to be stopped and needs to be challenged. How how do we do that? And and I think part of the reason, perhaps, why the challenge is proving a little bit slower out of the traps than, than the offence is, is partly linked to what you just said. It's this sort of sense, there's a book, isn't there, it was set in America, but it's called It Couldn't Happen Here. And I think that, that we do have that sort of slightly complacent sense that the stuff we read about and the rise... And look at this list, think of this list, Ted, which David Allen Green has, has put up on Twitter today, a brilliant legal and, and, and indeed Brexit commentator. Those who do not think the rising threats of political violence... I, I will put on my car key and pick up a 
rifle or whatever, strident nationalism, attempts to bypass parliamentary institutions and increasing nastiness towards minorities. If you think that these don't indicate the beginning of a turn towards fascism, then ask yourself what would? What, what else do you need to see in order to recognise or to hear the echoes? It doesn't mean that we're on rails towards a fascistic future, but if you're warning that that seems to be the direction of travel, then political violence being threatened in public, strident nationalism, attempts to bypass parliamentary institutions, increasing nastiness, for want of a stronger word, towards minorities. What else are they waiting for, Ted? Well, I, I, it goes back to the problem of an, of an echo chamber. They, they're all shouting at each other and they're all getting more and more angry and they think that there's no one opposing them because people in opposing views are sitting in their own echo chambers. Yes, that could be true. Although, again, this echo chamber phrase is up there with I know you are, but what am I? I, I get accused of being in an echo chamber and I spend three hours every single day inviting calls and taking calls from people who disagree with me. But that's the thing that people like us don't understand is that we still feel some sort of residual loyalty to the truth you know so if you say something that's not true you you admit it if you make a mistake you you own up you don't kind of embark upon a terrible desperate attempt to wriggle off the hook and yet when you're dealing with people who lie as easily as they breathe our tactics are, are i think i worry sometimes they're a bit rubbish <laughs> I'd like to agree with you that we all admit to making a mistake as soon as we realise we've made it. It's Not as true. soon, but sometimes eventually we, in some cases. <laughs> yes. We sometimes we double down in our lives and 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 and, and propagate um, stuff that you even know is worse. But you, you and that gets, off. of course, you're invited to do that by the people who say that anyone who's pointing out your error or anyone who is just questioning whether you still hold true to something that has been shown not to be true is sneering at you or insulting you or condescending towards you. It's so powerful, this stuff. I feel that we're making progress in unpicking it today. So the key platforms would be, if you criticise Jacob Rees-Mogg for accepting an invitation, having been warned about their um, uh, history, accepting an invitation from a group that thinks Doreen Lawrence should be repatriated, if I criticise him and say that kind of conduct has no place in public life, then someone whispers in your ear that I'm insulting you because you voted to leave the European Union. If I say Boris Johnson is, is well, his own employers have attempted to fend off a complaint about basic dishonesty in his column, basic inaccuracy, by claiming that he's not supposed to be taken seriously. He's a sort of comedy polemicist. If I point that out and say, how can you be following someone who is described as a comedy polemicist by his own employers. How can you be following him to the cliff edge? Then apparently I'm insulting you. I think we've made some progress this morning. Thank you for your attention this morning. As I, I'm using you as a sounding board upon which to, to try to work out where we are and, and perhaps where we're going. You will be aware, probably, um, by dint of listening to this programme, this radio station, you, you, you have more than a passing interest in current affairs. You'll be aware of David Lammy's comments about extremism um, on the Andrew Marr programme yesterday, where I, I, he'd made these comments before, which is why the the news impact that followed is, is, for my money, slightly questionable, considering that Michael Heseltine, when he was invited later yesterday on Channel 4 News, to either dismiss or, or uh, endorse David Lammy's comments. Michael Heseltine, former Conservative Cabinet Minister, Secretary of State for Trade and Industry. Um, I think it was Trade and Industry. Don't sue me if it wasn't. Deputy Prime Minister under John Major. There you go, I can have that. He, he essentially agreed. He talked about, as we have a million times on this program, how the, the conjunction of an economic crisis and a refugee crisis and bad actors on the political stage attempting to scapegoat and blame can create really horrible circumstances. And, you know, you hear Rhys Mogg this morning talking about how Farage is within the pale of British politics. It's really funny. It's, it's, it's really funny how pendulums swing and things change. I've said it before and I'll say it again. I don't think Rhys Mogg would be cheerleading for Nigel Farage if Nigel Farage was dressed in Stone Island and bother boots. Um, just a thought. 10.36 is the time. And we'll have a look at this supporters group. It's not affiliated, but j Dog has been asked to comment on it. And you won't believe, I don't think, um, you won't believe the inadequacy of his response, but it speaks of an environment in which he knows that even though people on a Facebook page dedicated to supporting him are calling for elected British parliamentarians to be hung, 
to be assassinated, he knows that he doesn't have to condemn it in the current political climate. And that's astonishing. Jim's in Beckenham. Jim, what would you like to say? Thanks for taking the call, James. I'll just say to your, your researcher, look, I'm, I'm a lead voter and I based it purely on the fact that David Cameron to stand on an election step with Barack Obama and then Barack Obama saying to, to English people or to the to British people that you've got to go to the back of the queue if you don't vote to stay in. Yes. That was the only reason I voted to come out. I know it's a feeble, re- it's a feeble reason to come well, out. It's not feeble and I would once have, that would have been a blue touch paper for me and I'd have weighed in with all the usual observations about other foreign politicians who, who but it, 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 mate, it's a vote. We, we, we walked into that booth on that day and we had what, whatever was in the forefront of our minds but prompted us to put pen to paper. The idea that these are, for everybody, that these are decades-long obsessions is just absurd, isn't it? But the, the dangerous thing is that the likes of, of Reese Mogg and Boris Johnson, you know, to call them closet racists, is, they're not, because they are, they are racists. Well, they're not here to defend themselves against that accusation, but um, if they wish to do so, I'd be happy to read out any statements that they submit but- to the programme. As I was saying to your researcher, the mm. biggest danger that, you know, and I, you know, I listen to your show all the time. I, I actually came off of, of reading the papers and, 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 and listening to any form of radio because I just got fed up with all the Brexit stuff. All the, I, I don't yeah. like politicians, full stop. Fair enough. Some of them are but, all but right, the mate, trust me, but I don't, I'm not going to have that <laughs> argument with you today. But the, as I said to your researcher, the, big, the biggest danger today, and I can see it now, is that, and this is going to sound, and I am a white, uh, a, a white middle aged man. Sure. I'm on social media, and I don't read the papers at all now because I just can't stand all the rubbish in them. But the red tops, they are making the white working class man go back to a vision of of what they thought was utopia in the 60s and 70s. And I'm going to speak from a London perspective because I'm a Londoner. They thought London was a a utopian view, and and they're they're making them hate anyone, as they perceive as not this horrible word, insidious English, you know. Yeah. They're making them hate people. And I, I, you know, I'm, I'm a married man of, of 25 years. They, they are actually. Years. I think I think we should stop pulling punches. They are encouraging full on hatred. 100. percent And, and this, this, you this, look this, like this, a letterbox. You look like a bank robber. We need less Islam. Yeah, I mean, there's, there's no there's no mistaking what that what that involves. And, 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 and they shouldn't let it go because you know that is just that is adding fuel. I mean, this is the dangerous thing. You know, Boris Johnson and, and Rhys Mogg are very very clever men. And they've, they've very got highly time to educated. Think about what they, well, highly educated, mm. right? and, and they've got time to consider what they're going to say. The man that reads the red, red top paper without being stereotypical, he's going to listen to that, and he's going to fuel to the fire, and it's going to make them hate everyone they don't perceive as their own. And it's, it's, it's an awful situation we're in today. How do we put the brakes on then? Oh, I, I, you know, I thought about this, and I, I do say to people that, and I've got loads of friends that voted Remain, and I've got a few friends that voted to leave. Yeah. Um, it sounds very simplistic and very insular, but I say to people, and I say this to my daughters, you know, they're in their twenties. Mm. Only base the views on, on what you see with your own eyes. Don't read the papers. Listen to the news with with, with an open mind. Yes. Don't read the papers. Just view what you see in, in everyday life. I've got two, I've, my oldest daughter goes to Queen Mary's in East London with a master's degree. Yes. She's the only white female in, in our intake of that year. Sure. And she comes home, and she's got friends of all walks of life. But she, she, because she bases, the way she's been brought up, she's based to view on what people are like. Not but the do you know some, some, some people from your background, as you've described it yourself, would yeah. be using almost the, exactly the same words to describe why they're so angry. She's the only white girl in her class. That, that, I mean, you can see, and I can see, how that can be enraging if it's not properly examined and it's not properly explained. But it's, I suppose what I'm no, saying but is... I don't, but I don't think, I don't no, I know think you the don't. side of it. Yeah, I, know, but I know people can do, but that's what I say to my children. Now, when, you go, when I go to university and my youngest friend's 16, she goes to school, Yeah. I say, view people how they treat you. No, no, I say yeah. it's very simplistic. It's not, I don't care. It's Christianity. It's your, well, <laughs> now I'm an atheist. No, I, I, I'm, I'm just saying it. it's not simplistic in, 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 no, in every no. sense of the word. It, it is Easter week, it's Holy Week. I appreciate you're an atheist, but if there's ever a time to remind ourselves that treating others as we would like to be treated ourselves is a bedrock of all the Abrahamic religions, then it exactly. would be this week. As I, said to, as I said to my children, it's the way you should view life. It's very, it is very simplistic. How people treat you, you treat them the same, like, you know, within reason. Don't base anyone on colour, sexuality or anything else. It sounds very sort of, 
it's easy, but it's the best way to treat. Yeah, well, you keep saying, you keep saying, you keep saying simplistic. That is humanitarian. That is the, the the safest way, you know, to ensure that your children get treated well is by trying to create a society in which everybody tries to treat each other equally. And there are people of every creed and colour who don't like what we're saying. It's not by any stretch of the imagination an exclusively white or an exclusively working class position, but it is obviously in the context of numbers. It's 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 easier to get traction and movement among the massive majority of the population than it is among minorities. Jim, thank you, mate. I, I, I really appreciate your call. That's two for two, then. So this is the point, isn't it? I try to think who... Because we complain a lot, possibly even moan a lot, about the 48% being completely ignored by most of the media. And it occurred to me this morning that, although that's probably or possibly or arguably true, certainly in the context of the BBC and the decision not to treat the referendum result like the beginning of a process but to treat it as the end of a process to brook no more conversations about whether it was the right thing or the wrong thing to do you, you, you look at the 48 percent which is obviously bigger than that now um they are being a little bit ignored but i'll tell you who's really being ignored people like jim and rod and my other callers who voted to leave the european union for a whole host of perfectly plausible credible reasons and are now being told that 17.4 million people are supportive of boris johnson and jacob rees mogg as they bend the knee to steve bannon amplify neo-nazi political parties on twitter and for reasons that i'm sure they remain as repulsed by as we are somehow inspire comments like this from someone called rod McEwen on the Jacob Rees-Mogg Facebook fan page talking about Anna Subri. She should be shot the most hated person in Britain. At least the PM was having a go, but not her, the traitor. Someone called Cheryl Halliday writes on the Jacob Rees-Mogg fan page on Facebook. A great target for assassination. Mark Bennett writes Anna Subri needs hanging outside the Houses of Parliament. And, and so it goes on. Joe Cox's murder by a far-right terrorist isn't off limits for these people. Um, Mick King writes, have they forgot what happened to Joe Cox? Katie Woolsey writes, definitely she was sacrificed for the greater good of a Remain outcome to the referendum. That's a suggestion that it was some sort of false flag. June Foster writes, she was a traitor to this country. Glad she's dead. These are public, public pronouncements, public platforms dedicated to supporting Jacob Rees-Mogg, where people now feel comfortable enough to write stuff like that. Um, Tortoise ad. We got in contact with Jacob Rees-Mogg, who condemned those issuing death threats, but told Tortoise that, and I quote, the vast majority of posts and comments are perfectly fine and abide by the rules of the group. Um, should we have a look at a, 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 a few more, shall we? Uh, just, I mean, things that are not part of the massive majority. This after 100 people died after a, a, a boat capsized in the Mediterranean. Um, Oh dear, how sad, never mind, as the late Windsor Davis would say. It does not happen all that often, but every so often some really great news gets published, right? Someone called Philip Rowlands. Oh dear, what a shame, but will it stop them, says Reg Dixon. Michelle Ricks writes, why are we funding walls to keep out migrants in other EU countries? This is absolute madness. The ignorance and the nastiness is weapons grade. It's not happening by accident. And yet, when David Lammy sits in a television studio and calmly explains the echoes he can hear from 1930s Germany and other fascistic movements. Calmly explains it. I go on social media and see people saying, what's the difference between this and that bloke that got arrested for screaming Nazi at Anna Subri? And, and you sort of think, if, if you're really asking that question, I, I don't know what to do anymore. My impulse would have been once to explain to you the difference between David Lammy sitting in a television studio and saying, here are some things that these two men have done. And these actions, this evidence leads me to conclude that they are flirting with feelings and tides that we last saw in Europe in the 1930s in Germany. The difference between that and following somebody, going peaceably about their business and screaming abuse in their face is so acute, so complete, so obvious that there's a little bit of me that thinks people are only pretending not to understand. And then, of course, I'm being condescending and sneering and calling you stupid because I, I don't quite grasp how anybody could see a comparison or, a, or a, um, an equivalence. Imagine if, 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 if I thought you were a being a bit Nazi. And I sat here and said, well, old Bert, he's, 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 got, he's got Mein Kampf on his arm. 
on his bookshelf, but it's under my favourite books. He's not reading it for research. He's got some Nazi memorabilia up on the wall. He's, he's a bit of a Nazi, old Bert, isn't he? The difference between that and then me following Bert out of work, I possibly with a phone in his face, screaming, Nazi, Nazi, Nazi. Like, they're two very different things. Regardless of how well-founded the accusation or the allegation might be, again, I find myself thinking, if, if you are professing not to understand the difference, then I believe you are pretending. It's 10.46. Jess Phillips, another Labour MP who is in receipt of rather more bile than I ever thought I'd see in Britain in my lifetime. Um, there is... We're not entirely clear on what the rules are when we're in an election period, but um, if somebody who'd threatened somebody you love had said they're not even worth, and forgive me, this is a very unpleasant phrase I'm about to utter, you might want to cover the little one's ears. If somebody who had said to somebody you love, you're not even worth raping or I wouldn't even rape you, and then you found that they were uh, potentially running for public office, how would you feel? Mm. But Jess has commented on this Jacob rees Facebook group and said, if a group of this sort existed in my name, I would demand it be immediately shut down and take legal action to ensure that it was and seek for all the hate crimes within it to be prosecuted. Um, how does Jacob rees respond when fan pages dedicated to him that call routinely for his colleagues, even on the Conservative benches, to be murdered? How does he respond? The vast majority of posts and comments are perfectly fine and abide by the rules of the group. Come on. Well, we've had our differences if you voted to leave the European Union. We've still got our differences if, if you think that it could in any way have turned out differently or better than what we already had. I get that. But you're not on side with this sort of stuff. MPs should be hanged. Imagine if it was an Jem Chowdhury fan page that contained stuff like this about elected British politicians. Would we be comfortable with Jem Chowdhury coming out and saying... Oh, well, I condemn those issuing death threats, but the vast majority of posts and comments are perfectly fine and abide by the rules of the group. Would we? Would we be cool with that? I wouldn't. I don't think you would either. So what's the difference? If it was a James O'Brien fan page calling for Jacob Rees-Mogg to be murdered, I'd call the police. So why, when a Jacob Rees-Mogg fan page calls for Anna Subri to be murdered... Does he condemn those issuing death threats, but the vast majority of posts and comments are perfectly fine and abide by the rules of the group? And then you listen to what David Lammy said yesterday, and the people he singled out, the Reese Moggs and the Johnsons, the people who bent the knee with Steve Bannon, a man who claims that you should wear accusations of racism as a badge of honour. You tell me how the response to that could be anything other than alarm. Go on, tell me. 0345 603. And if, if you think you're going to go for the, well, it's just lefties causing trouble argument, again, I love and respect you, but you can't call Michael Heseltine a lefty. Well, you, you can, of course, but it would be like claiming that the moon was made of cheese. Condemn those issuing death threats, but the vast majority of posts and comments are perfectly fine and abide by the rules of the group. Anna Subri should be shot. She's the most hated person in Britain. At least the PM was having a go, but not her, the traitor. Great target for assassination. Anna Subri needs hanging outside the Houses of Parliament. So if you don't like what Lammy said yesterday, or you, you, you're keen to dismiss it, or you don't understand that Nazis were Nazis <laughs> decades, in some cases, before they started killing people, then surely the stage at which... Fans of British political figures call publicly under their own names with profile photographs in some cases, call publicly for British politicians to be murdered. Surely that's the point at which you begin to realise that maybe Lammy should be listened to. And if it's too much to ask that you listen to Lammy, then surely you would listen to Michael Heseltine. Give me a call now and tell me why you wouldn't. 0345 6060 973. Ian's in Leeds. Ian, what would you like to say? Hello, yes. Um, the call that you had um, a while ago from London, um, the chap who voted for uh, yes. voted Leave. Yeah, I think we'll need, we think we need to hear more of that from uh, Leave voters, because I think that, um, you know, more Leave voters need to start saying, not in my name. That, that's the phrase, right? isn't it? Yes. 
Not in my name, and it's not a big ask, is it? I mean, for crying out loud, it, this stuff is, 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 I mean, it's next level disgusting. Look, look, look here's the thing. Muslim, Muslims were expected to condemn the likes of Abu Hamza and Abu Qatada. Well, not by me they weren't, later. not by me they weren't, but by a certain constituency in both politics and media they certainly were, and that same constituency is oddly silent about people being expected to condemn death threats, genuine death threats, because most people on the side are abiding by the rules. But there you are, and but, but when Muslims did condemn them, it was over the case of they're not doing enough. You need to condemn more. You need to condemn more. You need to condemn more. It's, it's, it's a bit like myself, for example. I mean, you know, I am black myself, mm. but it'd be like me trying to say, well, someone like Louis Farrakhan, who calls white all white or white people devils, yes. and says that they were created in a in a lab by a mad scientist, <laughs> it'd be like me saying, yeah, he's got a point. Yes. Rather than saying, well, actually, it's absolute it's nothing. Monster. It's got no more to do with me than flipping bungle and zippy. It's it's just utterly alien from my experience and my endorsements. But that's what racism and fascism does. It defines yeah. you by your external appearance. It says you are a gypsy. You are a black man. You and therefore you are lumped in with this group. Now, shall I read you some more? This is in response to the question again on the Jacob Rees-Mogg Facebook fan page. Somebody asks, who thinks we need another great fire of London? Here are the replies. Sam Turner writes, no, just a firing squad. Graham Wiggins writes, far preferable. Why destroy a beautiful building? Martin Lawrence writes, put me down for it, mate. I'm a pretty decent shot. Pat Rees, we need Guy Fawkes. Mel Spittle, no, just a gallows out front of Parliament. Jackie Bridges, bring on Guy Fawkes. That will stop the temper tantrums. Surely rent kill says Graham, is all that is required. They guarantee to get rid of pests and vermin. If this was an Anjem Chowdhury fan page talking about non-Muslim people, what would happen, Ian? I'm pretty sure that I'm pretty sure the boys in blue would be involved. I don't, don't know and about that. I'm thinking how my people in my profession might respond. Oh, well... Yeah, what what would the Sun good. editorials look like? You know, yeah, the Daily Star imagine. had a front page because some tin yeah. pot outfit with about six members stuck something on the internet about wanting to turn Buckingham Palace into a mosque. It was front page yeah. news. Here you've got Jacob Rees-Mogg fans queuing up to call for the killing of his colleagues. And he thinks it's a... Well, obviously I condemn the death threats, but the massive majority of people on the website are abiding by the rules. Cheap shoes for peasants. Well, 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 well what Reese Moore got to do is go through all the comments and the fine tooth comb and actually consider his own words. And here because is the question. Is Why wouldn't he? Yeah, well... Be careful how you answer that, my friend. I shall leave it hanging in the minds of everybody <laughs> yeah. listening. Why on earth wouldn't you publicly condemn, absolutely castigate, definitively disassociate yourself from people calling for yeah. your colleagues to be killed? Why would you not do that? He could have done it today. He had half an hour in front of a microphone. He could ease... May I just say at this point, I'm terribly sorry to interrupt, may I just say how utterly disgusted I am by the number of people on Jacob rees Facebook fan pages calling for my conservative colleagues to be killed. Why would he not do that? Uh, well, uh, don't, don't, don't. Just leave it hanging. That's all. Why would you not do that? I, I cannot think of an answer. So James O'Brien Facebook fan page is calling for all, I don't know, Sagittarians to be strung up in the streets. There's a James, James O'Brien Facebook fan page calling for uh, everybody who didn't vote to remain in the European Union to be killed. It's naming politicians. It's naming... A Jacob Re a, a James O'Brien Facebook fan page calling for Jacob Rees-Mogg to be strung up in the street. I'd call the police. Or I'd, I'd get somebody here to do so. I'd certainly draw attention to it. I'd ask Facebook why they're not closing it down. I leave you with that thought. Regardless of how successfully you've been manipulated into thinking that David Lammy did anything remotely controversial yesterday, and regardless of how effectively you've stuck your fingers in your ears to pretend that Michael Heseltine didn't agree with him, why wouldn't you want that stuff taken down?